Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining PropFlow's Green Homes webinar series. Today, we'll be discussing getting value from energy efficiency, discover how to save money and improve your home. Thanks for joining us. I'm Pam Barbato, founder of Action Net Zero, a community interest company. Our purpose is to help accelerate sustainable change, and our mission is to empower communities, people and businesses to take affordable actions to tackle the climate and ecological crises. I'm delighted to be hosting the webinar today, joined by our expert panel, who I'll introduce shortly. Um, in terms of what we're going to cover today, we're going to be looking at the benefits of energy efficiency, um, looking at how it affects health and well-being, and where do homeowners start if it, when it comes to making their homes more energy efficient. We're going to look at heat pumps and dispel some of the myths that we know exist, and look at how does energy efficiency affect the value of your property, and how can mortgage providers help and support you. So now moving on to some general points about the process itself. Um, you can hear us, but we can't hear you, which is perfectly normal. The webinar will last an hour um, and you can ask questions at any time using the webinar functionality. So if you've joined through the Riverside app, you'll see a little speech mark, which you can click to enter the chat. If you've joined through LinkedIn, then you can post questions in the comments. We have a dedicated Q&A in about 20 minutes um, after we've heard from our panelists. We're also recording the webinar and we'll circulate it to you afterwards so you can watch it back um, at any time. So onto the programme today, it's a pleasure to now invite our expert panellists um, to introduce themselves. We have Luke Loveridge, founder and CEO of PropFlow, Mark Bowen, heating and energy consultant, director of CLPM, Mark Golan, estate agent at Yopa, and Richard Fernandez, mortgage advice manager at Habito. So it'd be great if each of you can now tell us a little bit more about yourselves and your roles, please. So Luke, firstly, over to you. Yes, thank, thank you, Pam. Hi, everyone. I'm Luke. I'm the founder and CEO of PropFlow. We provide energy efficiency tools to help you understand the benefits of retrofitting your property and then connect you with uh, improvement suppliers to get direct quotes and then help you then manage those improvements and the impact of those afterwards as well. Um, we were the first one-stop shop, energy efficiency one-stop shop to launch in a mortgage lender, mortgage broker and an estate agent. And we are engaging over 1.4 million uh, homeowners. Thanks, Pam. Brilliant. Thanks, Luke. Rob. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Pam. Um, yeah, so my name is Rob Bohm and I work for CLPM Limited. Uh, we are a construction consultancy business assisting clients with their building projects. Uh, we have a quantity surveying and project management team and I head up the heating and energy department. Um, just a bit of a bit of a numbers here. Uh, around 30% 30, 30 of the total energy used in this country is used by our homes and around 60% of our household energy is consumed by heating. So, and we are committed to reduce this impact. We are fully independent consultants to have our clients' best interests at heart. We cut through the internet misconceptions and clear, give clear and concise advice. My principal pursuit is working with clients and their architects to ensure that their properties are as efficient as practically possible and that they're all aware of the various heating options and their consequences. I checked that their clients' heating and water supply needs are covered in the design specifications. This I carry out for extensions and renovation projects as well as new builds, as is equally important for all. I also assist people wishing to improve the energy efficiency of the existing homes and would like an impartial review. This service is frequently taken up by clients who have recently moved house. We had a nice quote from a client recently, said that we were looking to save the planet one house at a time. It would be nice if we could speed up that process a little bit, but time takes time. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Rob. And Mark, over to you. Uh, thanks, Pam. Thanks for inviting me on. I'm Mark Gall, and I run an estate agency in the north of Scotland. Um, I'm a great advocate of um, green energy. Um, however, um, uh, I think the, the perceived green energy is not, uh, from a buyer or seller point of view, high in their priorities. I built my own property a few years ago, made it as eco as I possibly could, heat, uh, heat exchanger, air source. Um, however, where I built it, the planning department allowed me to have PV cells, for example, on the roof. So we're, we're a bit of a, uh, a cross between um, what maybe the green energy people like us would like and the actuality are perhaps not connected quite yet. Brilliant. Thanks, Mark. And last but not least, over to you, Richard. Thanks, Pam. Hi, everyone. My name is Richard Fernandez, and I'm the mortgage advice manager for Habito Mortgages. I've been in the mortgage industry just over a decade now, not like uh, not that I'd like to admit it. And in the last five years, I've been working with Habito Mortgages. 
Um, so at Habito, our approach revolves around using cutting edge technology to streamline and modernize the mortgage process. So through the utilization of digital tools and data driven solutions, we're committed in our mission to make mortgages, the home buying process and more recently retrofitting easier for all. Brilliant. Thanks, Richard. As I'm sure you'll all agree, listening, a brilliant panel of experts for our discussion today. So we're now going to ask each of our panellists to go through a short presentation before we start taking your questions um, within our live Q&A. So, Luke, if you'd like to go first. Hello, I'm Luke, the founder and CEO of PropFlow. In this presentation, I will go over some of the key benefits of making your home more energy efficient, but also covering uh, sometimes an overlooked benefit around the impact on your health and well-being. Firstly, at a national and global scale, climate change is having an impact. By the end of the century, climate change will be costing the UK economy uh, more than the government spends on defence, policing, transport and overseas aid combined. We're importing nearly £50 billion a year in terms of energy, uh, and in 2022, that rose to 117 billion. So we're, we've got a huge dependency on foreign countries for our energy supply. But the most obvious individual benefit is direct energy savings. A small solar system and battery can create savings of around £16,000 at a cost of around 8000 So it's a decent investment. We've also estimated that more energy efficient properties could benefit by nearly £3,000 from mortgage lender incentives. But there are also mortgage lenders that are looking at other ways to encourage energy efficiency, and that could include increased affordability. So how much more can you borrow on your property and also more flexible lending criteria as well. According to RICS, the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors, it could also increase your property value by up to 15%. This is termed the green premium. And in future, as green becomes the standard, a discount could be applied to more inefficient properties. As an example, here are two real identical properties that were on sale last year. One had solar, one didn't. You can see that the market is pricing in improvements, but ultimately local markets and circumstances of the seller will also uh, create some nuances. So depending on how much more you can get for the, for the property. It's also important to note that landlords can benefit from uh, some limited tax relief and also maintaining compliance with minimum energy efficiency standards, which could potentially tighten in future. But one of the things that many people really don't consider is the impact on their health and well-being. Energy efficiency impacts the thermal comfort of your property, the indoor air quality, and also how exposed you are to changing energy prices. Heat waves and cold snaps are increasing. Cold homes alone cost the NHS £1.3 billion per year. Poor indoor air quality caused by things like mould and dust mites contributes to respiratory diseases, heart disease, cognitive def deficits and cancer. Smart home technology is now widely used pre and post retrofit to monitor that a property is suitably ventilated. And recent events uh, from the Ukraine war to attacks in the Red Sea have shown just how volatile energy markets can be. By investing in things like solar panels and batteries, you have a longer term price stability on your property. So what support is available? We've developed a tool called GreenVal, where you can get a report on your property that looks at these overall benefits, including health and well-being. And we're the only one that includes a health and well-being in the resilience uh, rating for a property. And it also helps you compare improvements, see the financial return and get quotes from tr our trusted suppliers. This is only available through our, uh, our partners, including Action Net Zero, Yopa, Habito, Molo and Hodge. And finally, we are currently involved in a project which gives discounts on improvements such as £700 off solar, £700 off a heat pump, up to £1,000 of free smart home technology and a free EPC. If you are interested, please reach out on the email below or get a quote from one of our uh, partners. Thank you for listening and I hope you found this presentation useful. Brilliant. Thanks, Luke. Um, and in terms of that health and well-being piece, if we heard, there's some great stats that you surfaced there and uh, aligning to the benefits, which is really good to hear. We're now going to move over to Rob, who's going to do his presentation. So, Rob, over to you. Thank you, Pam. Um, 
good to hear from you all. Um, I hope you're going to find these all these presentations useful as a, as a good bit of information for you. So um, the first thing I hear is, um, can I have a heat pump? And are heat pumps any good? And are, are they will they work with an old house or will they work with a new house? So the first thing to think about is um, heat pumps suitability. It's not the case of whether heat pump is suitable for your house, but quite often more the case of your house is suitable for a heat pump. Are they any good? Yes, you can read online that heat pumps are brilliant. You can also read online that heat pumps are rubbish. And unfortunately, both statements are completely true. It depends on the application. The right kit in the right place is perfect. The wrong kit in the wrong place just does not work. So these things we have to think about. So let's let's get down to basics. So what we're trying to think about is we want to reduce your energy full stop before even we think about heating. Uh, and the simple thing to think about is the more insulation you have, the less heat load required, i.e. the less power you require to heat your property, therefore you reduce your energy usage. It's a simple correlation. But one thing to think about is that when you start um, improving the insulation in your property and incre increasing what we call the air tightness, we also got to think about ventilation. But first of all, in terms of insulation, we've got to think about where is it all going? So the simple thing always is roof insulation is number one. It's a simple, quick, easy fix how to, how to do that quite often many times. But when you insulate your roof, you always got to think it's a roof quite often needs to be ventilated as well. So if you completely close it all up into the eaves, you can increase condensation with your roof. So you need to think about these things. It's not just a case of jump ahead and do it. You need to actually think about how it needs to be done. Now, the floor is usually the, the least important, unless you have an older property with suspended timber floor, then it can be really, really high. The walls, the greatest surface area, so generally speaking, that's quite often the biggest thing, especially on a detached property, and they have to think about how that can be done. Then doors and windows are usually less, but then again, if you've got a very old property with single glazing and drafty or metal frames, that can be a, a large requirement. But in terms of ventilation, it's something which often gets forgotten about. Ventilation is really, really important. We need to have fresh air in our properties. Now, as we insulate them, we put new windows in without trickle vents. All of a sudden, the air quality drops dramatically. So the air quality is paramount. We do need this, but we want controlled ventilation rather than uncontrolled ventilation. So you have trickle vents. Please use them. Allow air to come through. Obviously, the PS to resistance is to have a full mechanical ventilation system, which can filter the air. It can actually preheat the air coming in which is super super efficient because sometimes up to 30 or 40 percent of your heat loss is actually through ventilation so coming up with a good ventilation strategy for your property is really really important so let's let's think about what are the options do we have so natural gas majority of towns and cities and even out in the country have have natural gas we all know what it is it's nice and easy it's it's very cost effective it's still the cheapest form of heating per kilowatt hour by a stretch of imagination. It's if you look at it, it's roughly three times cheaper than electricity per kilowatt hour. So that's quite significant. Um, LPG um, comes in, but it's normally pretty expensive. Oil is a, is a, is a usual um, methodology throughout in the country. Again, relatively cheap to fit and run high carbon. But one thing you are open to market forces. And when we have conflict in areas of the world where oil is produced, you find the price goes up quite um, quite dramatically. Direct electric in terms of electric panel heaters, electric and floor heating the like, very cheap to fit, low capital cost, but very expensive to run because of three times cost per gas. Then we look at renewables in terms of heat pumps. They can be pricey to fit, but there are grants available to help. But if you're serious about reducing your carbon, it really is the way to go. So first of all, is it suitable? So the first thing to do is you need to have a survey of your property to do a full review because you need to think about what you need to do to actually allow a heat pump to be fitted. I do get really quite frustrated when we hear sort of blanket statements come across saying, yes, we're all going to fit heat pumps. Everybody's going to be happy. Isn't that wonderful? Well, that's not quite the case because you actually need to form a plan of how you're going to do this. And you may actually need to alter your house to suit because what we talked about beforehand is improving the thermal performance of your building potentially the draft proofing to reduce your energy, which makes the heat pump more suitable. So when people say to me, oh, I've got an old house, it means I can't fit a heat pump. That's not necessarily true. I have lived in a Cotswolds. So I have got a two to 300 year old stone cottage. 
I have had a heat pump for the last three years. I'm very happy with it. My energy costs are suitable. They are absolutely fine. So it's no problem. It's all to do with the size of the heat pump. The heat pump has to be sized correctly that it will suit the total output required of your property. Now, the power supply is it can be a limiting factor because you can't have you know, two or very large heat pumps if you've got a standard um, power supply. But the first thing to do is once you come up with a strategy of how you're going to insulate your house, you need to have a measured survey done. Then to determine the heat and ventilation losses, which will then determine the size of the heat pump and also the size of the radiators. Now, it's no good doing this before you do your thermal improvements, because if you were to get a heat pump installer to come to your house, size your heat pump as the building stands, he will size it and say, yes, you could have one. It needs to be this big or cost you this much. Then if you then next year then insulate your house very thoroughly, all of a sudden that heat pump becomes too big. You spent too much on the heat pump, so you must do the thermal improvements first. That's the law of average. That's where you must do that all the time. Again, the question people say to me, oh, I understand that heat pumps run much, much lower temperature than gas boilers, means none of my radiators are going to be suitable. Again, that's not necessarily true. Yes, they do run at a lower temperature, but if you've insulated your walls nicely and your roof and done your windows, there's a good chance the radiators you already have could be suitable because they only run at a lower temperature, they have a lower output, but therefore your room requires a lower output because of improvements of insulation. So heat pumps, good, good efficiency is the main thing. They have what's measured as seasonable coefficient of performance or SCOP. What that basically means is how much energy is required to drive in to how much heat you get out. So they have an SCOP of a reasonably three. That basically means as over an average of a year, one kilowatt of power will produce around about three kilowatts of heat. Now, this can actually be improved depending on the type of heating. If you're running underfloor heating only, then that number will go up. They are moderate cost, they're not horrendously expensive, and there is an element of flexibility in them. Now, what the problem we've had is the limited output. As I mentioned previously, if you're looking to sort of have one on a single phase power supply, which most people have, that will limit the heat pump size and outputs that you can have. If you have a three phase power supply, then you have, can have multiple heat pumps or larger heat pumps. Another issue is the unit location. It's not a nice looking bit of box, really, is it? You know, you don't want it sat in front of your house or sat on your patio, but there are means of ways of putting it in the right place. There are systems available where the heat pump can be put further away from the property. You can screen it so you don't see it. But one thing you have to do is have a noise assessment carried out to make sure it doesn't become an issue for one of your neighbors. Again, people say to me, oh, I've heard they're really, really noisy. Well, they're not. About the sound of a dishwasher when at full, full level, and they do speed up and slow down, and they are considerably quieter than an oil boiler. So therefore, noise not normally an issue if it's placed correctly. Then we have ground source heat pumps. Now, ground source heat pumps, because they're working with a grunt constant temperature underground, they even have a higher performance. They can get up to an SCOP of around five, which is incredible to think you're getting five kilowatts of heat for one kilowatt of power. There's no external unit, there's no um, nothing horrible to look at, and they are completely quiet because there's no sound outside. But the groundworks involved can be very disruptive, very costly, and you need a large area of land, somewhere in the region of 100 square meters per kilowatt. So you need a, pretty much a field if you've got a decent sized house. And also you need internal space because the kit is a lot bigger than you have with, a, with an air source heat pump. So to summarize, the first thing is to define your requirements and your expectations. What are, what are your plans for the future? You know, what are, what are your objections? What do you actually want to do in terms of this property? And then to con consider the actual options which are available. Once you've done that, you draw up an overall strategy. And then once you've done that, you can look into the specifics and the actual details. Once you've done that, you confirm the specifications and then you can get these works costed by either a quantity surveyor or by getting pricings from contractors. But please, please, please engage suitable contractors. Any contractor working on an air source heat pump or ground source heat pump must be MCS accredited. With that accreditation, you know you're going to get somebody who's bona fide, who know what they're doing and also can apply for the grants. So I hope this, be, this has been very useful for you. And if you do need any further information, you can contact me directly. 
Brilliant. Thanks, Rob, for such a comprehensive overview on heat pumps in particular. That's really good. I'm now going to ask Mark to present. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, I, I come from a standpoint of being over in green energy. Um, when in 2008 the EU introduced the Energy Performance Certificate uh, law that we had to have in place for properties, I thought this was a great step forward. But going forward to where we're at now in 2024, and um, the, you can count on one hand in a year how many people buying a property buy on the basis of the EPC. I think our industry is, is completely behind um, the, the curve with regard to green energy. And, and I can put that in a, in a couple of numbers, really. Um, uh, the, the EPC rating for rental properties uh, is now being put to 2025, uh, a C rating minimum by the Scottish Government. I'm based in Scotland. Um, the, the, there's no such minimum rating for selling a property. Um, so the, the EU ruling um, has, has been a great thing because we have to advertise it, but very few buyers um, actually look at uh, the, the EPC rating as a uh, buying decision. If you look at Rightmove and Zoopla and all the major websites, you can um, filter by price, postcode, bedrooms. You can't filter by EPC. So I think the likes of the, the, the main uh, websites really need to be... Um, asked to focus on um, the EPC as a search term. Um, but reality is that the, the buyers out there aren't really um, searching for it or, or even questioning it. Um, so I liken it to an older property, for example. Um, if you uh, put a brand new kitchen in an older property and you spend £27,000, does that increase the value of your property by £27,000? No, it does not. It makes it more sellable, perhaps. It's the same with um, energy efficiency measures. Um, and and I can um, um, another way of looking at it is that from from a landlord point of view, landlords are forced by the government to comply with the EPC rating of a minimum of, of C. Um, what's not happening is the landlords aren't spending the thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds that would need to bring their rental property up to a C rating. They're selling them, and I'll put that in numbers. This morning I checked, uh, and I'm based in Inverness. Inverness plus forty miles on right move. There's a thousand and eighty properties for sale. Inverness, 40 miles plus on the rental market, there's 17 properties available for rent. There's a social issue there with um, uh, really encouraging the, the renters to not be able to rent, that they, they can't get onto the rental market. But it's also the landlords coming away from the rental market because it's no longer financially viable. And one-off landlords such as myself, for example, um, if you're not making any profit at it, which a lot of my clients aren't, which is why they're selling, what's the point of doing it? Um, and uh, from, a, from a YouTube point of view, I've got a YouTube channel with hundreds and hundreds of videos on it. And every time I search to see which is the most popular videos, which has got the most views, it's the stone cottages. It's the stone properties. It's the, it's the lovely views that go with a stone cottage. Never do you have modern builds that, that show up. And by a massive margin, the popularity of the um, the uh, the stone properties uh, are much much more popular on youtube um so so there's an issue with regard to what the green energy wants us to happen and i'm a i'm a great supporter as i said earlier i, I built a property i don't live in it but i built it with a, as much green eco as i could put in it and was thwarted by the local planning because i wasn't allowed to put photovoltaic cells on the roof of a south south facing roof of the property um, and, and that's annoying because i could have free energy there more or less all year round so that's annoying and i hear that quite often with clients i'm not allowed to um, the the part that was mentioned earlier by rob about the um the the ground source ground source is really popular but as he said you need to have a big chunk of land to make it happen air source you don't the the little cottage i built a 50 square meter footprint and a very tight site and it just works a treat. Um, so, um, you know, that, that's kind of my look at the, the, the Eco's thing on, on new and used properties. Brilliant. Thanks, Mark. Really good to hear um, how things are um, obviously in Scotland. And we'll touch in our Q&A in particular, I'm sure, about the differences across the different regions. Uh, but now over to Richard. Thank you very much. Um, so how can your mortgage lender help make your home more energy efficient? So this is an ever evolving and changing piece in the industry is it is relatively new. So there are a number of ways in which mortgage lenders are offering help and rewards when it comes to making your home more energy efficient. So with purchases and remortgages, some lenders are offering enhanced cashback by moving your property into the next EPC banding or increasing the rating by a certain number of standard assessment procedure points within a certain time frame after your mortgage completes. 
So you just evidence this by requesting an updated EPC or even having the work done by certain trusted companies by the lenders. Some lenders are also open now to using tools such as PropFlow's very own green valve platform, which shows ways to make your property more energy efficient. And other lenders are offering potential discounts on energy related products. For example, Barclays have been offering discounts on the Hive thermostats. For properties that customers already own, some lenders are also offering what they might typically call typically call green additional borrowing or green home improvement mortgage products for their existing mortgage customers. So these rates can be lower when doing certain works to improve the energy efficiency. For example, traditional insulation, solar panels, boiler upgrades, air source heat pumps, double glazing or even replacement windows. So there's some extremely competitive rates available for this. For example, Nationwide are currently offering 0% rates for existing mortgage customers, um, borrowing between 5,000 and 15,000 pounds to get this work done. So for lenders, um, so for lenders at the moment are also offering help to those who are purchasing or already own energy efficient properties. So there's potential for enhanced lending amounts for new build properties as new builds typically are more energy efficient and lenders recognize this by offering slightly higher lending amounts as the associated energy cost of these properties are often lower. A more common option for lenders to offer cash back when purchasing or remortgaging an energy efficient property. This typically ranges between 200 to 500 pounds and is paid after the new mortgage starts. And not so typical are enhanced rates for energy efficient properties. These aren't as common in the marketplace at the moment, but hope, hopefully moving forward, this will be uh, more commonplace as offering a, a better rate for customers is more beneficial than just paying a little bit of cash back. And for all of the above, you'll need um, an EPC rating of A or B for um, residential properties and uh, or a uh, predicted energy assessment rating or even a C for a buy to let um, property. How can your broker help regarding mortgage lenders? So when it comes to criteria, lenders are regularly changing this as well as their pro mortgage products. So this is likely to be more common when it comes to green products as they're relatively new feature in the mortgage industry. So a mortgage broker would be best placed to find the most appropriate lender for your needs. The other way is ensuring that you're getting the best possible deal. Brokers often have a wide range of lenders at their disposal so they can compare the best possible deals, including highlighting the green mortgages for you which can be the best option, even if it's with a lender who only deals directly with customers rather than brokers. So there are many brokers out there, including fee-free ones like ourselves at Habito, who will be able to do all of this for you. So regarding getting the best deals, the table on this slide is part of an evidence of research document which is issued by brokers such as Habito to our customers. So on here, we can see a number of mortgage products cannot be recommended because a minimum EPC rating has not been met as labelled on the far right column. So the top two deals on here are from HSBC and they're green deals offering £500 cashback as circled. This demonstrates what a customer could have had if they had an energy efficient property. And in the second from right column, we can see here that there are products ranked in the in an order of the most cost effective over the deal period. So here, the green HSBC deals would have been the best option for the customer if they had an energy efficient property with an EPC rating of A or B. So other ways some brokers have been helping like Habito are offering tools such as PropFlow's Green Valve tool um, in making properties more energy efficient and environmentally friendly. So in summary, there are many options out there with the mortgage lenders when it comes to green options and mortgage brokers like ourselves at Habito are best placed there to help you out when it comes to getting you the best possible option. Brilliant. Thanks, Richard. Really good overview to see, uh, obviously, how brokers and are supporting um, the transition. So we're now actually going to move on to our live Q&A and uh, take some of our listeners' questions. So um, in terms of the first question, we're going to be focusing actually on how does energy efficiency affect air quality? So back to your original conversation, Luke, you know, you talked about, obviously, that some of those key um, components of air quality would you like to just uh, give us a bit more detail in terms of that question? Yeah, yeah, and I think Rob touched on on this really well uh, as well. So obviously, uh, you know, if you're getting solar panels or uh, a heat pump, that might not necessarily affect air quality. So it, it does depend on what improvements you're making. So it's 
mainly associated with um, insulation. Um, and as Rob said, it's really crucial that you uh, ventilate the property and make, but make sure that it's within your control. A lot of people say, oh, well, you know, my home's nice and uh, you know, airy, but it might be that there's a draft in the door or the windows are not adjusted right, which is not what you want. Um, I, I know, for example, on the, on the continent, they open windows at, at night to let the fresh air in, like all of the windows. And even in winter, if you do that for 15 minutes, it doesn't really affect the thermal um, capacity uh, of, of, your, of your home. So a part of it is also behavior. And this is where, you know, having the right, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, products in place. So like extractor fans in bathrooms with no windows, mechanical ventilation, et cetera, where that's needed is really useful. But what we're seeing is much more use of smart home technology. So my previous business, which does uh, heat loss, draft risk, um, mold detection, indoor air quality, um, is deployed in like you know, 300,000 uh, devices um, so far. So that we're really much seeing that pre and post retrofit work so that you can A, target what works you need in the first place, and then B, to understand what that impact has had, not just on the thermal efficiency of the property, but also the indoor air quality of the property as well. Brilliant, thanks. And actually thinking, Mark, from your perspective, are buyers really aware of the effect on air quality when they're thinking about a kind of energy efficiency or purchasing? I, I think in the 4,000 odd property that I've sold, I don't think I've ever been asked that question, to be honest with you, no. Okay, it's really interesting. And Rob, from your perspective, how aware are people of, of the correlation? I, I think they're not, and that's, and that's one, of the, one of the problems, is that um, you know I've been done service on so many properties where windows were changed like in the 1980s uh they've got no trickle vents um and they're ringing with condensation a lot of people don't actually realize that when you pull your extractor fan on to take the you know the steam out of your bathroom or in your kitchen you can't draw out a plastic bag you know if if the room is pretty much airtight you're not going to draw anything out it's as simple as that so you know so if you have trickle vents when you're going to have a you know shower open your trickle vent before you have a shower and then shortly afterwards, then you close it again. Likewise, and when, when like um, one thing we've come across, what we call sick building syndrome. And uh, what people don't realize is that if you've got a sort of, especially on a smaller property, it's actually worse than a larger property because it's due, due to the volume of air. But, um, you know, people say, oh, you know, I wake up in the morning and I've got a thick head. And I, oh, why is that? Well, because, you know, you've got a small room, your bedroom door shut, you've got no air coming in and you're breathing in carbon dioxide. It's as simple as that. But also, Every new thing you bring into your house off gases, you know, it's, you know, the chemicals off it, basically, or that what would like almost like the new car smell. It, it's not a nice thing. It, it's a bad thing. And, and we get a like a, especially in the winter, we get this real fog in our houses, which we unfortunately can't see, but we're breathing it in. So higher levels of carbon dioxide, lower levels of oxygen, higher levels of moisture, which then condensate on your glass and on the walls and so on and so forth. And then any other chemicals and things we bring in. So by ventilating the house, it's really important to try and clear this out to give ourselves a good, fresh environment. So, yeah, ventilation is important. But um, as we said before, it wants to be controlled rather than uncontrolled. So therefore, you can ventilate when you want to. Um, so you also find some double glazing have what we call night vent, where you can open the windows just a slight amount and then close it again. It just gives it just open a very, very fractional amount. That's especially good in the summer to just keep ventilation going through the house at, at, at all times. But if you are do, doing a deep renovation of your property, like, you know, we're going back down to the bare, bare bones of the property, then a full mechanical ventilation system could be fitted. And that's something you may be worth considering. But please, please, please do get, inv get advice and look at the consequences of doing that. Great. Just thinking about our listeners, um, obviously, we've highlighted that it's such a crucial part of any uh, greening of homes. But thinking about some of the practical steps, what might we be able to? We've talked about mechanical ventilation systems, which is fantastic. But are there some some simple things that can be done uh, to be able to improve that over and above, obviously, the uh, opening of windows, etc. So, um, Luke, Rob. I, I, I well, would you like to start on that? I mean, the, yeah. I, 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 I'm really surprised sometimes. I walk around people's houses and they quite often don't see the, see the obvious. Um, I went to a house a little while ago and um, they had a broken cat flap um, on the back door. Um, it was a sort of a, a, a through flow from the, from the kitchen, from the back door through to the front door, where they had a, a loose uh, letterbox. 
Um, in the living room, they had a really big sort of open fireplace um, and they had what we call suspended timber floor and they'd taken up the carpets. And they were, and they were wondering why they were always cold um, and when the heating bills were really, really high. Because effectively, there, there was just this constant through flow of air. Any heat was being sucked up and drawn up the chimney and taken out. And, and just this cold draft was coming through. So you can, you can basically fix your cat flap for a few pounds. You know, you can put draft excluder on, on, your, on your doors. You know, you can fix that, that broken um, letter box. And you can get these um, either chimney balloons or chimney sheep. Or there was a really good one on Dragon's Den a few years ago, I think, called Chimella which is like an upside down umbrella, which you can pop up your chimney. Now, please, 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 when you put these things in there, remember they're in there before you light your fire. Um, and if you have an open, what we call like an open gas fire, like a living effect gas fire, you must not, you must never, never put anything up the chimney unless that gas fire has been completely decommissioned, because obviously it is a serious risk if you were to light it with it being on. But these are simple measures which do not break the bank. They're really quite cost effective and they can make a colossal difference to, to your home. Brilliant. And Luke, I was just thinking about smart tech. Do you want to come in on some of those great opportunities? Yeah, a good example is, you know, I've put some smart um, uh, tech into my property, uh, quite cost effective. And, you know, ended up, I've got a new build. And so it should be fairly, you know, energy efficient. Um, and ended up having some sort of amber warnings of heat loss in sort of like my downstairs bathroom. I thought, oh, that's that's interesting. Why, why is that? Um, turns out that the, the pipe work was just open to the air, basically. And again, just as Rob was saying, spent you know, a few quid on some um, spray foam to just to seal up that, that, um, that pipe. And, you know, it, it, I, I then saw in real time that the draft risk and the, the heat loss risk had gone down and was actually back to sort of normal levels. So there are sort of, uh, yeah, just as Rob, Rob uh, was saying, there's some cost effective insulation bits you can do prior, uh, I think, to sort of thinking about sort of the external, internal wall insulation, all of that sort of stuff. There, I think there's some sort of basic stuff you can do first, um, sort of assisted by smart tech, but also, um, you know, you can get thermal surveys for a few hundred pounds, which can detect a lot of these issues as well. Um, yeah. Brilliant. Great. I think we've covered a great uh, range of opportunities there. Um, actually, we've got a question that's come in as well. Uh, this one's specifically about organisations. It says, how do organisations measure the amount of energy used or saved when distributing energy saving measures like window insulation kits or draft excluders? Who'd like to take that one? Luke? So is that in terms, organisations in terms of like uh, lenders or retrofit companies? Um, I suppose what I could um, sort of touch upon here is that as part of the tools that we supply to lenders and brokers, obviously the green bow tool is one aspect and that's what the consumer sees and they see the report on their property, connect with the suppliers, etc. But we also have essentially an analysis tool for the lender to understand what the performance across their portfolio is. Uh, and then that helps to sort of um, you know, uh, channel uh, support to those customers, but also measure the impact. And that's quite crucial because particularly for mortgage lenders, um, currently they've got mandatory um, you know, reporting on the uh, EPCs and the finance emissions of their back book. So who they've, who they've lent to. Um, and although currently not um, uh, mandatory and a lot of them have self targets uh, of sort of net zero by certain dates, by 2035, 2040, 50, et cetera. Um, and the FCA, the Financial Conduct Authority, is monitoring the delivery of those um, uh, of those carbon reduction plans. So, you, you know, there is pressure and there's a reason why lenders want more energy efficient properties, because they do consider, consider it a risk on their, their portfolio, whether it's around affordability, can people afford to pay, uh, pay their mortgages, um, or is it around for example, regulation risk. So, um, you know, there's already regulations around uh, landlords can't rent out below an E. Uh, in Scotland, that's gone up to a C. Um, in the UK, that will probably, something in that form will be brought back at some point. Um, the government has a target to be, for all properties to be EPCC by 2035, I believe. So there's a huge sort of risk on the horizon around regular regulatory change so which lenders want to mitigate so they need to measure and understand what that risk is yeah absolutely 
Goodness. Hopefully that answers the question. No, we've, we've had a thank you, so I think that does. But please, again, if there's any, any other parts of that question that want to be unpicked, let us know. Um, so on to another question. I think this is what we'd really like to understand is, you know, what improvements generate the most value to a property? So, um, again, obviously across the panel, I'm sure lots of you have got to contribute. But Mark, I appreciate you're in Scotland. And I know Luke and the rest of the panel, we know that there are regional variations. But, yeah, let's have a little discussion around this point. Yeah, the, 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 the typical uh, enhancement would be uh, PV cells um, or even old, older solar uh, panels, um, fairly easy to fit um, and very effective. Uh, I'm, I'm starting to see a bit more PV cells on larger properties linked to a Tesla power bank that's now powering their electric cars, which I think is just blows my mind. I think it's an amazing thing to do. Um, doesn't add value as such, add saleability, uh, that's for sure. Um, and there are more and more people looking at um, ways to live that don't include burning fossil fuels. So uh, back to what I said earlier, I would like to think at some point value would be attached to that. Certainly saleability, and I suppose saleability would increase demand, demand would in increase price of, of the property. So the market will dictate at the end of the day. But uh, uh, to answer the question, uh, PV, cells, uh, PV solar panels are, are probably the, the quickest and best way to add perceived value on the property than saleability. Yeah, yeah I, I would agree. But um, I think what I would say, I've always used the sort of yeah kitchen um, example is like, you know, but more around the purchasing of that kitchen. It's like you wouldn't get necessarily purchase a new kitchen or a new bathroom because uh, it has a, a large ROI or like every year it will generate X number of savings. You get it because the enjoyment of it, um, whereas uh, energy efficiency is actually not just the enjoyment. So maybe the thermal comfort of your property. So there's actually a direct that impact on your comfort and enjoyment levels of your of your property, but there is actually uh, energy savings. So unlike a bathroom or unlike a new new kitchen, there is a defined estimate of like how much energy savings you can receive. So um, I obviously appreciate Scotland's uh, you know, slightly different, but uh, there have been a number of reports around um, you know increases in property prices through increased EPCs. Um, but it will be nuanced by, by you know what what type of buyers, what type of houses is it, is it? So for example, new builds, there might be a lot of young families who want to uh, have more energy efficient um, properties, for example. So then they do prioritize that more. In sort of rural Scotland, maybe there's um, you know people who again, Mark, you might you know, obviously be expert on this, but maybe they're retiring and they're not actually that fuss too fussed about energy efficiency, and they want to retire in a nice you know, lovely scenic area, and that's what they're prioritizing. So it is down to buyers. But I think what one thing I you know, would say is, you know, there's a, a large demographic pushing through that are climate conscious, the Gre Greta Thunbergs of, of the world. Um, and they are demanding more energy efficient and eco conscious, climate conscious properties for sure. Um, so even discounting all the um, you know, return on investment and, you know, regulatory changes, risk around that, which will drive value, it, 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 it will ramp up. Um, there are, is that big demographic of customer demand coming through um, at some point. <laughs> yeah. Just Sorry, an, Martin, wanna... as, as an anecdotal example, I was at a property yesterday, at seven years old, new build, big, big, uh, well-known builder in the area. And to my complete surprise, there was an oil tank in the garden. That's a seven-year-old yeah. new build property. So, yeah. Why are the builders getting away with that? Um, why would the owner want that as a choice? I don't think they did want it as a choice. There's no natural gas in the area, so it was, uh, you know, for a new build property as I have built, the insulation levels are so high. In my head, it's daft not to have some sort of heat exchanger system to heat it. So that was a seven-year-old property with an oil tank and oil boiler. Just I shook my head. I think it goes back to the policy, doesn't it? Until government actually accelerates the changes that are required from a build perspective, unfortunately, there's always a catch up, isn't it? If we think about the, the amount of time it takes to plan for these developments. Um, I have an interesting question that's come in as well, which is what are some innovative trends, please, or technologies emerging in the field of energy efficiency um, that homeowners should be aware of? So are there any particularly exciting? OK, Mark, thank you. I love, I love, I think Luke mentioned it, the Hive system. I mean, 
I just think it's a fantastic system. You can be in your oil rig somewhere working and, and put your heating on for your wife coming home from, from work, that type of thing. It's uh, I think that's um, the way that I see a lot more of that happening, a bit like Tesla cars. You can set it to be warm before you go to work type thing. So um, that's what I've seen, uh, and I quite like seeing it. It seems quite simple to work and very effective. And the feedback I've had, it's, it's a really positive thing. Yeah, I, I agree. We use, um, through our system, Wiser, which is by Schneider Electric, one of, by Andreessen Controls, which is one of the sort of leaders in, in this, this field. And I've got it in my home and, you know, every room I can set to different temperatures and different routines, which saves me a lot of money um, for sure. So that's a very simple thing. One thing I would mention, which I want to really explore a bit more, is around heat batteries. So um, for me, I can't get a heat pump at the moment because I want to do something to my patio, so there's nowhere to put the heat pump. Um, but I was looking at heat batteries, which could go in, in my cupboard upstairs. Mainly at the moment, that's really um, around the, direct, the hot water. Um, but it just means I can charge at lower tariff rates. And um, yeah, my solar can just get dumped into that heat, heat, heat battery and discharge at the right time. Um, but like I said, at the moment, it doesn't do the heating side of things. So um, yeah, I do see, see there's a lot of potential in sort of storage solutions in terms of heat storage solutions which could potentially complement or be an interim um, if your property is not quite suitable at the moment for, for heat pumps. But um, Rob, I don't know if you've got any yeah. other sort of trends or... Um... Yeah, well, there's one thing which is which is changing and is slightly is, is the, you know, we're talking about, you know, your uh, multi-zone control systems, which work really, really well, by the way. Um, I have one similar. And I've, you know, I have every room set up at a different time and every temperature. So effectively, the house is heated as we use it rather than heating as a whole. And by doing that, you know, you can reduce your energy costs quite significantly. Um, and if you have like a, a large house or a house which is quite drawn out, that works incredibly well. But um, there's another sort of um, sort of um, school of thought. It's something we call weather compensation. And this works incredibly well with air source heat pumps. So what that basically means is that the output of the heat pump is adjusted dependent on the external air temperature and the internal air temperature of your property. Now specifically works very well if you have a, a smaller property because of the, the multi-zoning doesn't work quite so well because effectively when you heat one room, you kind of almost heat in the other room as well. So what this effectively does, it creates a very comfortable environment. Now the thing is about heat pumps is that the lower the temperature they, they run at, the more efficient they will be. So um, people say to me, oh, do they work in cold temperatures? Yes, they do. Um, but... Uh, due to global warming, our sort of average daytime winter temperature is about seven degrees centigrade, uh, which is quite, quite shocking, really. Obviously, north of the board, it's going to be a little lower than that. But um, generally for the rest of the country, it's around about that. So what these heat pumps can effectively do is that when it's, say, for example, you know, 10 degrees plus, where you still want a little bit of heating, the actual water flowing around your system is, is considerably lower than it would be if it's really, really cold. So therefore, the heat pump is working at its maximum efficiency that it can do all the time. Now, you don't have to touch it. All this software is actually programmed into the majority of all these heat pumps which are on the market today. And it just needs commissioning to work at the right direction. So, for example, the one I've got, I do actually have radiators in my house. So it actually does have to run at a, a higher temperature. But effectively, when it's 10 degrees centigrade, my heat pump's running at 40 degrees. Um, when it's at 9 it's dry, we're running at 41, and so on and so forth, till it gets to zero when it's running its highest temperature. So we're trying to maximize the performance of it. So this is technology which is not emerging, it's actually on the market and available today, but quite often not used. So some of it is actually finding out how, how to best to use what you've actually got or what you're planning to use. And there isn't a right answer or a wrong answer, it depends on you, how you're gonna use the house, and how you're gonna live in it, and what your priorities are. So that's why I think it's um, being sort of really thinking about it on, gran on a granular level is really, really important to make sure whatever system you put in suits your requirements as well as the house. Brilliant. Thanks, Rob. As you've got uh, going over to Richard, actually, we've got one around um, lenders. So thinking about actually what's the motivations? Why are lenders incentivizing energy efficiency? Um, Richard, yeah, if you could share your thoughts. Sure thing. So uh, Luke touched on it uh, briefly earlier. Part of the reason is uh, via, through the FCA. So the government actually contacted the F FCA to actually consider the net zero uh, agenda and their, their goals, the government's goals for this and to actually pull it in any legislation that they put towards the lenders. So 
like Luke said, lenders have to report back to the FCA about what properties they're lending on, the energy efficiency of that. So that's part of the reason. And the other reason for them is saleability as well. So naturally, lenders have got some in, a lot of interest in the properties they're actually lending on. So they want to make sure they're um, saleable moving forward and an energy efficient property moving forward will be more likely to be uh, saleable. And the other reason as well, so like we've touched on energy cost as well, uh, they're lower. And as we've seen in this country in uh, the last 18 months or so, energy bills are a lot higher. So um, that can put strain on individuals in terms of their monthly outgoings and can have a knock-on effect to mortgage payments. So naturally, if a property is more energy efficient, people are more likely to be able to actually afford their monthly electricity bills. So it puts less strain on their customers. And the other thing as well is, uh, like we've touched on as well, is that the general population have become more uh, climate aware um, in this day and age. So um, if, if one lender isn't doing any green, um, uh, aren't offering any green products at all, and every other lender is, it's not going to really look uh, very good on them at all. Yeah, brilliant. Um, Sorry, Luke. Just to sort of chip in there, I, I, there's also a number of like, um, bank comparison sites in terms of like who's the greenest as well um, and I, I just randomly went, went on one and just as I was about to leave it said oh have you changed you know your banks because of, because of the uh, and, you know the, the, the greenness of, of, of the bank that you've just seen um, which I thought was really useful so there is a there's a number of organizations sort of trying to be you know, make lenders and banks more transparent um, and show it, you know, basically so they can't greenwash anymore, um, which is which is really interesting. So they're going to have to sort of sharpen up on that for sure. Definitely. Then um, we have another 10 minutes before the close of our webinar. So I'm going to be focusing on another key question here, which is why is energy price stability important? So, Luke, you obviously touched on this in your original presentation. But, yeah, if we could talk, discuss it a little bit more. Yeah, I think it's it, firstly, it does depend on, uh, you know, the type of person and your requirements. So let's say you're retiring and let, maybe you're, you're downsizing. Um, and you've got a, a set budget, you've got a you know, li limited um, you know, income, you, know, you want to make sure that those energy prices aren't going to go up significantly. So, you know, we all know what happened, you know, February 2022, and like prices were doubling, and we really haven't seen that come back down, right? Um, so if you if we didn't have any support from the government, you know, a lot of people would be in a lot of trouble, right? Um, and really, I think it's going to come to a point if that happens again, why would the, should the government be stepping in if they've given you plenty of warning around actually gas is not uh, sustainable, your, your, your prices might rise? Why should everyone um, should, be, should be paying to subsidise people who have got um, oil or gas, right? So I think it, it, at some point um, that's not going to be acceptable anymore. So um Yes, yeah, so, so, so just just to summarise, really, um, you know, it depends on who, you know who you are and what you you prioritise. Um, but as a you know, so if you get solar panels and a battery, for example, what you're essentially doing is pre-purchasing le electricity for 25 years. So that just gives you really you know, stable bills. If you get a heat pump, you rely on more electricity. Um, which again, if you if you combine that with solar panels, you're more self-sufficient. Uh, you're not necessarily going to be at, at the mercy of Russia and uh, the Houthis in Yemen um, that are sort of driving up oil oil prices, right? So, um, yeah, so from a national perspective, energy security, really important, but even just from a sort of a selfish individual person, it just insulates you and just reduces that risk in future, which you can really put a price on if, you know, if your, your energy pr uh, price is going to double and you're exposed to that. And then it means you fall behind and get into debt, get into arrears, um, you're taken to court. You know, that could have sort of life changing effects. So um, I think we just need to be more self conscious of as a country, our energy security, but also our energy security individually. Um, yeah. And on that point, can I just ask actually the panel, do we think that people are aware of that opportunity in terms of taking some control over their energy and the, and the benefits from a, from a stability pricing perspective? Mark, you must have lots of views on this. Yeah, uh, no, I don't think they do. Um, as an example, when, when the, the energy spike was last year, um, big stone houses you couldn't give away. 
Um, and, and the reason for that was the perceived uh, huge energy costs that the media have had us believe. And yes, they have increased. Um, my estate agency way around that was simply publishing the 12 months energy cost for a particular property, putting that online and sort of bursting the myth as to it's going to cost you £2,000 a month when it's actually £200 a month. Um, there's, there's a local chap uh, in one of our villages here has got an energy store and he's an absolute expert on energy, a bit like Rob is. And I'm forever referring clients there to see what they can do to help you know, reduce their energy costs. Something I want to get more involved in is after purchase, helping people reduce their energy costs. Uh, but no, I don't. I don't think there's that awareness there. I think we just we just um, you know, ninety five percent of the population just uh, hear the news and watch Coronation Street as as opposed to thinking <laughs> hear, hearing the news. You know, um, and that's why I support this type of thing. I think it's 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 we're all going to be affected by that in the future. Uh, maybe not me, but my my children and grandchildren. So I think it's so important that we are aware of it. Um, but I think in the news, if there's a flash of news, it's either exaggerated or ignored at worst. Yeah, yeah. I do. I do think there's a um just a general lack of awareness on the wider benefits of energy efficiency and the sort of softer benefits, which you can't necessarily put a, a pound sign on, you know, health and well-being, price stability, or thermal comfort. People mainly just think about, is it saving me energy, um, which is important, but it's like, it's literally just one pillar on, on the whole uh, you know, number of benefits that there are around energy efficiency. On the mortgage side of things as well, it does uh, come into play, uh, which a lot of people aren't aware of. So when you're actually doing a mortgage application, most lenders don't actually ask how much is your um, energy bill each month. They just use uh, office or national statistics data. So in, if the nation's energy costs are a lot higher, um, in the background, they're going to be factoring higher outgoings, which can affect uh, mortgage affordability as well. So that's going to come into play there. Yeah, really good point. I, I spent 27 years driving back and forth to an office and when I started working home five years ago, it um, wasn't the saving of the fuel, it was the, the fact that I wasn't pumping out fumes unnecessarily. Um, I now work from home, as so many of us do. Um, so, that you know, I felt better smug, if you like, in the fact I was doing my little bit to stop fumes coming out of the, of the back of my car. So I only drive now to if and when I have to see a client. So there's, there's the kind of, if you're into that way of thinking, your mindset is I'm doing some good somewhere, albeit small. Great. We've only got a couple of minutes left of the webinar. So I think what I'd like to ask is just if you've got a, any key messages, top line um, tips for our listeners in terms of why to start to investigate or continue their journey to green their homes and improve their energy efficiency. So going from the top, Luke, from you, these sh short, short, sharp answers, please, given timings. <laughs> yeah, I think it's just around awareness of the wider benefits. Um, as soon as people understand that, you know, uh, it affects the health and well-being of your property and with more extreme weather coming as well, it's going to be more important. I think people just need to understand all of the benefits for doing retrofit, not just en energy savings. Uh, Richard, over to you. Uh, we've spoke about a lot of great benefits and uh, features people can put into their homes today. And it's really important that you speak to a, a mortgage broker who has access to all of these lenders who can actually help you. Um, achieve these goals of actually making your home a lot more energy efficient. So I'd recommend to everyone, if you're looking to borrow some more money, speak to a good quality mortgage broker, ideally fee free like us at Habito, and we can like we're in a good position to actually help you out with that. Great, Rob, over to you. Uh, to me, it's plan it, and um, just don't go, go jumping in with with two front feet because we have to be careful. Is that if you, you know, I mean, the temptation when you buy a, a nice house and you think, yes, first thing I want to do is put a new bathroom, a new kitchen, and then redecorate and put new carpets in it. And then think, oh, actually, should we spend the money on the insulation first? So it's, mm -hmm. it's you know, again, I'm sorry, but, you know, we all like shiny things. Um, and we're all guilty of that. But spend the money wisely on, on your building if you're doing a retrofit and think about how you can make your building so much better. But please gain sensible advice from independent consultants, if at all possible, because obviously if you go to a, a supplier, obviously they're, they're looking to sell you a product uh, and plan and also get it costed so you know you can it's within your budget. But planning is the most important thing. Great. And finally, Mark. Yeah, the way I word it is that, um, you know, especially for new buyers and new properties, they're going to be there at a minimum of, of I don't know, seven, eight, nine years, whatever the average is. Um, make it future proof and save yourself some money, because I would like to think within the seven, eight, nine, ten year period of people tend to stay in a property, I'll be able to say and we're allowing some of the value in the property to the whole life running costs. Um, and, uh, you know, you're, it is nice putting the shiny objects in, um, but it's also nice. My, my heating bills from my little two bed 
cottage I built was forty pounds a month. That's nice too. Yeah. That's a great, great motivator, isn't it? So that brings us to a close. Thank you all so much. Um, it's been really great to host today's webinar. And as a final to our listeners to say, join us in person at our next event, which is actually going to be on the 17th and 18th um, of uh, May. Come and see us on the Friday, the 17th at the Festival of Sustainable Homes at the National Centre for Self-Building Renovation in Swindon. We look forward to seeing you then. Thank you.